Funka Rosa Parks. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosa Parks, and uh, you know, I've lowered this mic from Malcolm, and it's still a little too tall. Okay, I'm a lot shorter than Malcolm. <laughs> um, I'm sure many of you have heard some version of my story before or parts about it. And um, I'm hoping that in my presentation you might learn some new information. And after my presentation, I would really love if, if any of you would be willing to share one or two new things uh, that you learned about my story um, after my presentation. Many have uh, tried to paint me as a quiet lady meek and frail, that the only reason I refused to, to give up my seat on that fateful Thursday evening in 1955 was merely because I was too tired. Well, I was no more tired than after any day of work. What I was tired of was being told by a white bus driver to get up and give my seat to a white passenger. I was no accidental activist. At the time of my arrest, I was the secretary for the NAACP, a member of the Montgomery Improvement Association, and I headed up the NAACP Youth Council. In fact, I've been an activist for two decades before I got on that bus. I think as you get to know me, you'll find I'm anything but meek and frail. I was born in Tuskegee, Alabama on February 4th, 1913. My full maiden name is Rosa Louise McCauley. Did anyone know my middle name before? Aha, that's some new information, right? Log that in for after the presentation. I have, um, I was mixed race. I have African American, Irish, and Native American heritage. My father, James, he was a carpenter, and my mother, Lenora, was a school teacher. And my mother was a huge influence on me. She believed in freedom and equality, and she did not have the notion that we should be living the way we were under legally enforced segregation of the races. She didn't believe in it. The way she talked, the way she carried herself, and, and her understanding that we were human beings and deserved to be treated as such, it took root in my young heart. My parents were separated before I turned six. My father wanted to look for work up north and my mother wanted to stay in the south. So me and my brother and my mom, we all moved to Pine Level, Alabama to live with my grandparents. I loved playing all kinds of games with my brother and going to church with him and my mom on Sundays. I loved to sew with my grandmother and just have conversations with my family. I really, truly loved living with my grandparents, but it turns out we had moved to an area with a lot of Ku Klux Klan violence. They would ride through our community, the black community, burning our churches, beating our people, killing our people. By the time I was six years old, I was old enough to know we weren't really free. My grandfather, Sylvester Edwards, opened my eyes to just how unjust the system was. He was the son of a slave and a slave owner, and he had been a slave himself. He was brutally mistreated by his owner, even as a child subjected to violence. His owner trying to starve him, wouldn't even give him any shoes. As a freed man in the segregated South, my grandfather was almost light-skinned enough to, to try and pass for white. And he would walk around with a gun in his holster, making it clear to everyone what would happen if they messed with him or his family. Now, most black people at the time were too afraid to, to own a gun for fear of white retaliation. But my grandfather, he enjoyed agitating those, those white folks who might have, might have had some uh, prejudices. He would walk up to them and shake their hand and, and introduce himself as Edwards where black people were supposed to go by just their first name or, or simply old man or boy. Watching my grandfather flout society's race rules gave me my first taste of overt civil disobedience against discrimination. 
And my grandfather, he taught me how important it was to stand up for myself in the face of injustice. When I was 10 years old, a young white boy named Franklin threatened to attack me. Well, I stood there fearless, grabbed a brick to defend myself, and dared him to go ahead and try. Well, my grandmother, understandably, was horrified when she heard this story, and she urged me to be more careful. Well, at 10 years old, I looked my grandmother in the eye and I declared I would rather be lynched than live to be mistreated. I went to a segregated school, and I loved school very much, even though it was one small room, actually much smaller even than this room that we're in now. And it had all ages, from very young to teenagers, all together in one room. Now, have any of you heard of Plessy versus Ferguson or, or uh, Board, Brown versus Board of Education? Well, quite a few hands. Now, what did, um, what did Plessy versus Ferguson claim? Does anyone, anyone wanna? Say what, what the claim that they made. All right. Separate but equal. That was what they claimed. But that was not my experience. My school was only in session for five months out of the year, whereas the white schools were in session for nine months out of the year. And we would all have to walk to school while we watched the white students get to ride the bus to school. Some white northerners came uh, to my community and built a new school called the Montgomery Industrial School for Girls. Their aim was to provide an education as well as a sense of pride. Well, this angered some white folks in my community and my school was burned down twice. My grandfather instilled a love for learning and I was a great student but I had to drop out to care for my grandmother and later my mother when she fell ill. When I was 18 years old, I met a man named Raymond Parks, and he proposed on the second date. <laughs> now, what would, you, what would you think if someone proposed to you and had to spend the rest of your life with you after two dates? <laughs> I thought this young man had lost his mind. But I was impressed by his character and his defiant attitude. He was a lot like my grandfather. He was the first real activist I had ever met. He was part of a pre-NAACP grassroots organization for civil rights. And they would, they would meet and uh, they would arm themselves when they met in order to be prepared if the Ku Klux Klan were to come break down the door. Sometimes there would be so many guns on the table, I wouldn't know where to set the refreshments. Well, Raymond, he shared my grandfather's concern for education, and he encouraged me to go back to school. We were married a year later. I finished high school and became involved with the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. Anything they needed done, I'd do it. For 14 years, I worked for them as a secretary, a justice for prisoners advocate. I even had dangerous tasks, such as investigating sexual assaults of black women by white men. This was dangerous because I had to go out into the community, collect evidence, interview witnesses for crimes that were not being prosecuted because they were perpetrated by white men and the victims were black women. In 1941, I got a job as a seamstress at the Maxwell Air Force Base. Did anyone know I could sew? Maybe some new information. Oh, some of you knew. All right, maybe that's not new for you. Well, <laughs> oh, because I just said it. <laughs> and have I sewed with my grandmother? Someone's paying attention. Thank you for being engaged. Well, because it was a federal institution, the base was integrated. Does anyone know what it means to be integrated? Uh, you and the white? Um, black people and white people work together in that area. Exactly, white people, black people working together, thank you. So because it was integrated, and by the way, this was my very first experience in a professional integrated atmosphere. Because it was integrated, the buses on the base were integrated as well. 
So I'd be riding on the bus on days with one of my new white friends, having a great conversation. But once we had to transfer from the bus on base to the city bus, we would have to stop our conversation and go to our perspective sections, the white section and the colored section. I made a conscious decision never to normalize this. We had to do a lot of mental gymnastics just to survive day to day as a black person in America. And I'm afraid we still have to do some of that today. Well, the law only stated that the buses had to be segregated. But the bus drivers would add all these unwritten customs so as to discriminate, so as to hold up white superiority and make us feel inferior. And these customs were treated by the courts like they were laws. And you could get arrested, you could go to jail for not following one of these customs that was not even part of a real written law. So the way it worked was there was a certain amount of rows set aside for the white passengers, and then there would be a sign that said black people could sit from here back. But that sign could move. So as more people would board the bus, if there were more white passengers left standing, they would say, oh, black people, get up. They'd move the sign back, say, this is the white section now, you have to move back. And that would keep happening until all the seats were taken by white passengers and they would make the black passengers get off the bus early. And even though they were made to get off early, they were never repaid their fares. I want you all to imagine for a moment boarding the bus. Say you have seven stops. Imagine the, the pit in your stomach. Am I going to be made to get up? Am I going to be humiliated? Am I going to be made to get off early and have to wait for the next bus or walk a long distance, maybe at dark, maybe in an unsafe area? Racism was right in your face and in front of a bunch of people on these buses. There were many brutalities and humiliations experienced by black passengers on these buses. There was one bus driver who was notorious for harassing his black passengers, and his name was James Blake. In 1943, I boarded his bus and I paid my fare, and he informed me that I was not even allowed to walk through the white section, that I had to get off and re-enter through the back. So I got off to re-enter, and he drove off with my bus fare. That would not be my last interaction with James Blake. Another hotbed of discrimination was the polls. During that time, they would make black people take a literacy test, knowing that many black people could not read or write. Now this was a direct result of what we were talking about earlier. Separate, but not equal. Imagine how much more you can learn from being in school for nine months instead of only five months. I tried to register to vote three times between 1943 and 1945. The first time, I was just flat out refused, no reason given. The second time, they claimed I got too many questions on the test wrong, even though I knew those answers backwards and forwards. So, the third time, I brought a pencil and a piece of paper, and I copied down the questions and my answers to have on hand for future legal challenges. Well, the registrar saw me do this and approved my application. Now, in addition to the test, there was a poll tax, which was equivalent to about $260 today. And many black people at the time could not afford to pay this poll tax. So me and my husband, we pooled money in the community to help other black people be able to pay that poll tax. Poll tax and I continued to work to get others registered to vote through the NAACP Youth Council's Voter Education Program. In 1955, I attended a two-week workshop at the Highlander Folk School to work on implementing school desegregation. Now, I have to admit, I was in pretty low spirits at the beginning of this workshop. I felt tense and nervous. I had been doing years 
of political activity with little to no change. Have any of you ever tried to make any kinds of changes in your community, gone, taken part in a protest or a boycott? And you feel so inspired, right, by the community there? And it can be frustrating when it seems so clear to the majority of people what's right, and yet you see little to no change. So I think some of you might be able to understand how I felt. But that's why community is so helpful. I have to say that going to this workshop, working with 41 other individuals, both black and white, might I add, my spirits did begin to lift. And we were all working for one goal, to desegregate the schools. I was 42 years old, and it was one of the few times in my life that I did not feel hostility from white people. I was also in awe of Septima Clark, who ran the workshop. She was so calm and courageous at the same time. It really was a great workshop, but I have to admit I still felt pretty hopeless at the end. They asked me what I was gonna do when I went back to Montgomery. And I told them, well, since Montgomery is the cradle of the Confederacy, nothing is going to happen there. There's too much white resistance and black people will be too afraid to stick together. But I did promise to go back and continue to work with the NAACP Youth Council. So I returned to Montgomery and, and continued to work with other civil, life, civil rights leaders. We recognized an opportunity for protest on the public transportation system, and we've been planning the boycott for months. In fact, I was not the first person to be arrested for refusing to give up my seat. Does anyone know the name of the first person? Yes? Yes, Claudette Coleman, say her name. I'm so impressed. No one in the last group had knew that, uh, that someone else had been arrested first, so thank you for sharing. Yes. Claudette Colvin, 15 years old, a 15-year-old African-American girl. She refused to give up her seat, citing her constitutional rights. And she was arrested and tried as an adult, even though she hadn't even broken a real law. But she was pregnant from statutory rape. And we fear that if we made her the, the center of our protest, that the other side might try and I twist the narrative and attack her character as an unwed mother. So we continue to plan, we continue to organize, and we're just waiting for that spark to light the fire. While I was involved in the planning, I never thought that I would be that spark. Well, I guess that brings us to that fateful Thursday evening, December 1st, 1955. I boarded the bus, and as fate would have it, there was James Blake, the same bus driver who had driven off with my fare all those years ago. I had avoided him, in fact, for 12 years. If he came to my stop, I would just wait for the next bus. But I was distracted that day. I was thinking of Emmett Till, who had been murdered that summer. I'd already paid my fare when I realized it was James Blake driving the bus. Now, I did not get on that bus to be arrested. I got on that bus to go home. But I had been pushed as far as a person could be pushed that day. I did not sit in the front, as many have written, and neither was my feet hurting, nor was I old or tired. I was only 42 years old, and my feet was fine. What I, I just felt determined that I would no longer indulged the legally enforced segregation of the races. I sat in the colored section, the last row, in fact, behind the white section, and we rolled without incident for a few stops. And then some more white passengers boarded, and one white man was left standing. So do you remember what happens when, when one white man is left standing? Yes? The sign moves back, exactly. And, I forget if I mentioned, but the whole row would have to be white. So if there was just one white man standing, all four people would have to get up and get him the row. So three other black passengers obliged. I refused. I thought of Emmett Till. I thought of my grandfather. 
I felt determined to take this as an opportunity to let it be known I did not want to be treated in this manner, and that we as a people had endured it for far too long. Well, the bus driver, James Blake, he told me to get up. I told him I would not, so he told me he would call the cops and have me arrested. I told him he may do that. And so he called the cops and two police officers arrived and boarded the bus. They asked me if James Blake had told me to get up. I told them that he had, and they asked me why I would not stand up. I told them I did not think I should have to. And then I asked him, why do you push us around? Well, one of the officers said, and I quote him, I don't know, but the law is the law, and you are under arrest. And so I left the bus under arrest. I don't know why, but I felt no fear at all in this moment. This was an inherently dangerous act with a very real possibility of physical brutality. In fact, many bus drivers were armed. I could have gotten shot, but it didn't bother me. And I felt no shame, no disgrace at being arrested for this, for challenging the systematic segregation on the buses. Well, E.D. Nixon, the legal redress chairman of the NAACP in Montgomery, he heard about my arrest and he paid my bail. And Joanne Robinson, the president of the Women's Political Council, read about my arrest in the papers and seized on this as the opportunity to finally launch our boycott. The WPC was instrumental in spreading the word about the boycott. They printed out leaflets and handed them out around the city. They coordinated with other organizations like the NAACP. And they organized carpools for women who had to travel long distances to get to work. My trial was on December 5th and they found me guilty. My lawyers filed an appeal and we met that day at the Hill Street Baptist Church and with some other civil rights leaders founded the Montgomery Improvement Association to fight for civil rights and to fight for the desegregation of the buses. Well, on the day of my trial, they stayed off the bus in large numbers. Most of them were just about empty. People would walk or get rides with people best they could. Some black-owned taxi cabs offered reduced fares. And uh, some people had white co-workers or white bosses that would pick them up and take them to work. And by the way, it was raining that day. Not an ideal day to boycott the buses. <laughs> people having to walk in the rain to work and so on. Well, the first day of the boycott was so successful that we realized what could be possible with a longer, larger scale boycott. And this would take a lot of planning and a lot of dedication in the face of quite a lot of resistance, threats, even violence. So to garner such support, we decided to pitch it that night of the first successful boycott and use it for encouragement. And to make the pitch, we selected an unknown, a new preacher at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church who had a gift for motivational sermons. Can anyone guess who that person was? Yeah? Yes, it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Exactly. Well, we met that night and thousands upon thousands came. There were so many and they kept, keep on, they kept on coming that some couldn't even make it in the church. Dr. Martin Luther King, he said, I want to tell you this evening that it is not enough for us to talk about love. Love is one pivotal point of the Christian faith. There is another side called justice. And justice is really love in calculation. Justice is love correcting that which revolts against love. He got a standing ovation. And our cause resonated with so many people in that church that evening. Many had experienced what I had experienced. Many had experienced even worse. They would board the bus, pay their fare, and then be made to get off early, never receiving reimbursement for their fare. Some bus drivers would refuse to wait for black passengers to board the bus and just speed off, which resulted in the death of one black passenger. 
Surly white passengers would push us around, bus drivers would abuse us, and cops would intimidate us. We took a vote, and of those thousands upon thousands of people there, it was unanimously decided that we would not board the bus until changes for the better were made. Now, can you imagine thousands of people agreeing on anything? <laughs> it was really quite remarkable. But again, we'd all been involved in working for, for years together. And so we did feel that solidarity that comes with community. So it's estimated that nearly 20,000 people stayed off the bus for the full 381 days that the boycott lasted. And by the end, over 40,000. There were four church bombings that year. Martin Luther King Jr.'s home was shot at and bombed twice, along with the homes of other civil rights leaders. These were homes with women and children, babies even, living in them. My husband Raymond, he would sleep with a shotgun by his side because we received nearly constant death threats. My mother would stay on the phone talking to friends for hours about nothing, just trying to keep someone else from calling in with another death threat. It was constant and persistent. Even my black coworkers refused to talk to me or look me in the eye. They felt I was causing trouble for them. I believe it was Jim Crow telling them, this is the best life you're gonna get and you could get killed if you resist. In fact, Raymond and I lost our jobs and became unemployable because of our activism. Finally, on December 20th, 1956, the Supreme Court upheld a lower court decision that it was unconstitutional to discriminate on public transportation. Our boycott resulted in the desegregation of buses in Alabama and across the country. As I look back on those days, it's almost like a dream. The only thing that bothered me was that it took us so long to have this, this protest and to let it be known wherever we go that all people should be free and equal and have all opportunities that others should have. Life was not always easy after the boycott. The desegregation of the buses was not embraced by everyone, and there was a lot of violence involved. In fact, uh, a young woman named Rosa Jordan, a sniper's bullet went through two of her legs on a desegregated city bus. I had financial struggles and eventually had to leave the South in order to get steady work. It wasn't until the late 1950s when Raymond and I moved to Detroit that he was finally allowed to register to vote. I continued my work and my activism in Detroit with Detroit Civil Rights Movement, and I was an active member of many organizations. Everything I earned, I gave back to the movement, from my speaking engagements to donations, everything. Finally, in 1965, I started working for a black Democratic congressman named John Conyers, and I finally was receiving good pay and health care. <laughs> now, uh, I retired in my 80s, and in 1980, having given so much financially and physically to the movement, and now widow, I was having financial and health struggles again. And I was almost evicted from my home but local community members and churches came together to support me. Finally, in 2005, at the age of 92, I passed away from natural causes, and I was the first black woman to lie in honor in the Capitol's rotunda, and the second black person ever. I spent my life after the boycott working to encourage and inspire young people. I founded the Rose and Raymond Parks Institute for Self-Development, and our main program was called Pathways to Freedom. We would travel to different states and work with young people from 11 years old to 17 years old, trying to give them a sense of history and, and also to encourage them to rid themselves of all 
prejudice and ill will towards others and, and to instead concern themselves with how they could best help other people. And of course, to get a good education and pursue all opportunities that are available to them. I believe in organizations. I believe that we need to work together and organize. There is still so much work left to be done. I feel that with the, the spirit within and belief in ourselves, we can overcome many obstacles that, that we could not with negative attitudes. It's far from perfect. There's still many unjust laws and discrimination and inequity. And you know, it may never be perfect, but I believe that if we continue to do our best to improve conditions, then more people will be benefited. We must continue to work together to form communities and organize so we can rip through the promise here in the home of the brave, the land of the free. Now I would like to end my presentation, if you'll indulge me, by singing my favorite song called Oh Freedom. It's a traditional spiritual and during slavery, the enslaved people, they were not allowed to sing or dance or take part in traditions from Africa. But they would meet in secret, sometimes thousands, at nightfall, to fulfill that need for community, to be able to meet with each other and express their pain, their heartbreak, and their hopes and dreams for a better tomorrow. Some would even sing while they worked because their masters thought it was uh, harmless or meaningless. The conditions were so horrible and inhumane that folks needed a lot of encouragement just to survive, a lot of hope. Itinerant preachers would come speak at these meetings and they would sing these spirituals for hours. To the enslaved people it was a expression of solidarity and hope. Oh, freedom. to all of you for, for welcoming me here. Now, I'm curious, it's that time, did anyone learn anything new about my story? Yes, in the white? I didn't know uh, Project Power's name. Um, I, I knew that in research of you that you were the first person um, to stand up, but I did not know um, the name of the woman who was part of it. And I also didn't know how young she was. Uh, I also didn't know that you liked to sew. I didn't know. <laughs> Yes, and my, you know, and that, I loved my relationship with my grandma, and luckily it helped me with the trade, and I was able to work and earn money from that quality time with my grandmother. I'm so excited that you've now learned Claudette Colvin's name, and her bravery at such a young age, 15 years old. Anyone else learn anything new that they didn't know about my story before? Yes? 
I didn't, yeah, that they would move it back, too. No, I think that so the point was to discriminate. They'd never moved the sign forward to make more room for the black passengers. That's why there really it really was a fallacy and, and Brown, Brown versus Board finally found that it was separate but not equal. Right? And to only move the sign back, it's not really fair. It's it's showing that the white people have more claim to the seats on the bus. Great question. Anyone else learn anything new? I think I see a hand in the back. Yes, you. <laughs> yes, December 1st. And so imagine a cold December day on the 5th, raining, and that many people being willing to walk to work in the rain. That's dedication right there. And I can't believe fate. I can't believe it was James Blake all those years later. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else learn anything new or have any questions for me? Yes? You know, for a white person to sit in the colored section, they're also breaking the custom, which is not the law, it's not a written law, but that would, that would put them at risk as well. So I personally never experienced that. I don't know if, if anyone else did, but there were white people, and it surprised me because I spent so much of my life only feeling hostility from most of the white people I knew. So when I went to the Highlander Folk School, for example, and I was seeing these white folks who also wanted the schools to be desegregated. It was so encouraging to me. And there were white people that helped with the cause and um, you know, it takes all of us working together truly to enact change. Thank you for asking. Yes? That's a great question. Someone in the last group asked the same question. As far as I know, he never really faced any consequences. And, you know, my case, it wasn't like as soon as the Supreme Court decision came down that my case was dismissed. We, that's part of why I had so many financial struggles was because we kept having to appeal and appeal my case and it just kept getting bogged down and, you know, with lawyers' fees. The, the justice system at the time was not uh, very sympathetic to my case. And it still is not. That's a good point. Yes? So uh, you said that bus drivers carried guns and that they could shoot you uh, for not getting up. What would happen if they had them to the bus driver? Yeah, they were allowed to be armed. And they were allowed to enforce these customs as if they were law. So if they were to be violent towards me, if they were to shoot me, they would say that they were enforcing the law, even though it was not, in fact, a written law. And there were all kinds of murders and brutalities that went unanswered, like the murder of Emmett Till. Good question. Anyone else have any questions or new information they learned? Okay, well I have a question um, for all of you. Um, I worked for years uh, to help get equal access to the vote for black people. And I'm just curious if any of you are willing to share your thoughts on, on if you think that everyone should have equal access to vote and why. And if you plan to register to vote, and if you think it's important to vote or, or not. Just any of your thoughts on that, on that subject. Yes? I think that um, voting is, and being involved in the politics for not only your own community, but for other communities is really important. And it's something that a lot of people don't think is important. Um, a lot of people, and I've seen it in personally in my family a lot, they think that 
When they're going to vote, they should only be paying attention to things that affect them. But paying attention and voting for things that not only affect you, but can positively affect everybody around you, I think is something really important. And especially for marginalized communities and black and brown communities, as well as Asian communities, um, a lot of times, like you mentioned, it was really hard for them to be able to even go and register to vote, not even to vote, but to register. And so today, we don't see that everybody has equal access to vote, but for the people of color that do, I think that it's really important that we all stand together to help um, kind of not pass these bills and not get these laws put in place that will further marginalize and oppress people. Wow, that was very, very well said. And I love that you say that when you go to vote, you don't only have to think about the things that affect you. You, you want to think about everyone and what will benefit the most people. And you know, the whole, the whole promise and dream of, of our country is a government made by the people for the people, instead of a king who just kind of decides or one of the most wealthy people deciding. And so when you, when you try to restrict access to vote, then it really isn't a government for all people. So, but I understand, you know, I, I know people too who don't really feel like their vote counts. And I have felt that frustration in my years of activism as well. So, so I can understand that feeling of, you know, you might vote for the candidate you want, you might, um, have even gone to a protest, you might phone bank for that candidate and then either your candidate doesn't win or you don't see the changes that were promised. And it can be so frustrating. But like you said, we had to fight for this right to vote and, and your vote is your voice. And as long as we are involved and try to improve conditions and, and most importantly work together, then people will be benefited. Yes? Um, I was just going to say that even from like a purely selfish standpoint, it's very important that there are lots of people voting because um, then politicians and decisions actually have the power to make that change. Sort of are forced to kind of cater to a larger audience and make better changes for people around them. That's a great point because, you know, if it's just a few of their wealthy donors that vote and they think that they can win just from off of those people. And if we don't have young people engaged, if we don't have minorities engaged, then they don't really have to follow through on their promises. That's a great point. Yes? Thank you for saying that. You know, um, a lot of times people feel like, you know, the law is the law, right? Like the, the policeman who, who made me get off the bus under arrest. The law is the law. You know, but, but sometimes I do think it's necessary for us to investigate whether these are fair and just laws. Like for example, the new law in Georgia that you can't pass out uh, refreshments, you can't pass out water to people in line to vote. I don't really know how that law makes sense. I don't understand how that's a just law. Because especially in Georgia in the heat and standing in line for hours because they might have restricted the poll hours. You know, or they have it on a day when people have to work and there's a big rush when everyone's off work ready to vote. Why can't we hand out water to thirsty hot people trying to take part in this democratic process? Thank you for saying that. Are we, uh, out of time.
Okay, well, thank you. I so appreciate your comments. You all are so articulate and insightful, and I have to say I was pretty nervous to perform in front of high schoolers, and you just really impressed me and blew me away with how respectful and engaged you were, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much.